In the middle of the night and under close guard, a new tank regiment arrived at a train station near the border with Belarusia. Alongside the T-34s, some very heavy, bulky objects covered in tarpaulin were unloaded from the flatbed wagons. The Red Army's plans in Belarusia were top secret. These objects would remain a mystery for several days until they were unveiled on the training ground. They were heavy metal rollers, which were to be attached to the front of a T-34. They transformed the tank into a minesweeper. The rollers would detonate any mine in the tank's path, clearing a safe lane for infantry and other vehicles to follow. Two regiments of these engineer tanks had been secretly deployed to the 1st Belarusian front. Clearly, the front commander, General Rokossovsky, was planning some sort of offensive. But to any onlooker, Soviet forces in Belarusia seemed only to be making defensive preparations. From the air, only movement away from the front lines could be detected. Everything was being done to give the impression that this sector was being weakened and that a Soviet offensive was being prepared somewhere else. On the 6th of June, 1944, the day of the Allied landings in Normandy, Stalin wrote to Churchill, the summer offensive of the Soviet forces, as was agreed at the Tehran conference, will begin in mid-June at one of the vital sectors of the front. Which vital sector was not even to be shared with Allied heads of government? In the east, the Germans were firmly on the defensive in June 1944, as they struggled to fend off the D-Day landings in France. Army Group North was retreating from Leningrad. Army Group South had given up the Crimea and much of Ukraine. Only Army Group Center seemed to be hanging on. German positions on this front formed the so-called Belarusian Balcony. Here, Army Group Center stood firm. Over the winter, it had successfully repulsed two Soviet offensives around Vitebsk and Orsha. Hitler and the German Army High Command had much to consider as summer approached. They had no firm intelligence on when or where the main Soviet offensive would be launched. The Germans decided that Stalin would seek to capitalize on his recent gains in Ukraine. They had brought the Red Army to within striking distance of Romania and its oil fields. So, in the summer of 1944, precious German reserves of tanks and aircraft were sent south. When the Soviet Stavka High Command saw German reinforcements moving to Ukraine, it confirmed their decision to launch a surprise attack in Belarusia. Here, the Red Army would be given the chance to avenge its worst defeat, suffered at German hands in the first months of the war. The operation was codenamed Bagration. The Stavka planned a series of assaults against the flanks of Army Group Center, which would be encircled and destroyed near the cities of Vitebsk and Bobrusk. Then the Red Army would advance on Minsk, cutting off German retreat. The Soviet planned nothing less than the total destruction of German Army Group Center. The Red Army had never set itself such a massive and ambitious goal. General Rokossovsky proposed that his first Belarusian front deliver two simultaneous thrusts against the German right flank at Bobrusk and Slutsk. Each thrust would be given equal priority. This contradicted standard Soviet military doctrine, which dictated that there be a single main axis of advance, with all other attacks acting in a supporting role. Konstantin Konstantinovich Rokossovsky was a decorated hero of the First World War and the Russian Civil War. 
but probably because of his Polish origin, he found himself under arrest in Stalin's Great Purge of 1937. Despite being tortured by the NKVD secret police, he refused to sign a confession or inform on his colleagues. He was released in 1940 and restored to his rank. At the beginning of the war, he commanded a mechanized corps, but rose rapidly to senior command. In May 1944, Rokossovsky was summoned to a meeting of the Stavka to defend his proposal. It was a dramatic scene in which his plan to deliver two simultaneous thrusts came in for much criticism. In his memoirs, Rokossovsky wrote, I was twice sent into the next room to think over the Supreme Command's comments. And each time I came back, I was yet more insistent that I was correct. At last, Stalin said, the front commander's persistence proves that the planning of the offensive has been thoroughly considered. It is a firm guarantee of success. Rokossovsky's proposal had the green light. Vitebsk was held by General Reinhardt's 3rd Panzer Army. But despite its impressive name, by 1944, 3rd Panzer Army had hardly any tanks left. General Reinhardt began the war in command of the 4th Panzer Division, but replaced Hoth as commander of 3rd Panzer Group during the Battle of Moscow in 1941. That year, his tanks had got to within 15 kilometers of the Russian capital. Army Group Center was made up of four armies, with a total strength of about one million men. Operation Bagration was to be the largest and most thoroughly prepared Soviet operation of the war so far. If the Germans had discovered the preparations, they would immediately have reinforced the Biela-Russian front. The forests and swamps presented enough difficulties. German reinforcements would have been disastrous. Therefore, secrecy was of the utmost importance. All troop movements took place only at night, under camouflage, with no lights. White posts were placed at the roadside to keep drivers on the road. Tailgates and bonnets were painted white so they could be seen by other vehicles. Units that hadn't reached their destination by dawn would immediately pull over and begin to camouflage their vehicles. A special pass was needed to drive a vehicle in daytime, and less than 100 passes had been allocated to each army. Soviet aircraft flew overhead to inspect the troops' camouflage. If a pilot spotted a Red Army unit, he dropped a pennant. This told the unit commander that his men could be seen from the air and that he had to improve his camouflage. Security measures were in place from top to bottom. Plans were drawn up by hand by just two or three officers and taken to the Stavka by the front commander in person. Around Vitebsk, the decision was made not to bring up any tanks for the first phase of the attack. There was too much risk that they would be detected. Red Army radio traffic vanished. Russian units were notorious for bad radio discipline. But as one German noted, the Russians broke with tradition and observed complete radio silence. <laughs> Meanwhile, Soviet soldiers practiced crossing the swamps and forests of Bielorussia. Infantrymen learned how to cross marshes, how to swim, and how to find their bearings in the woods. Many made marsh shoes so they could walk without sinking into the swamps. They built rafts to transport machine guns, mortars and light guns through the marsh. Logs and fascines, 
bundles of sticks tied together were laid to create roads for vehicles. Meanwhile, supplies flooded in by rail. The Stavka had ordered that the troops were to be issued with five times their normal ammunition load for the offensive. This amount of shells, bullets and grenades would require 6,500 railway carriages to transport. In total, 400,000 tonnes of ammunition, 300,000 tonnes of fuel and more than 500,000 tonnes of food and forage were delivered to the troops in Belarusia. It meant that every day, 100 supply trains arrived at the front. It was impossible to completely conceal preparations of such magnitude. But the German high command still thought that the Soviet attack would come in Ukraine. Field Marshal Bush, commander of Army Group Center, went on leave three days before the Soviet offensive. His million-strong army group was about to be attacked by the combined strength of four Soviet fronts. 2.4 million soldiers, 5,200 tanks and self-propelled guns, and 5,300 aircraft. The final preparations for the offensive fell to Red Army engineers. Both sides had laid massive minefields in front of their lines. Now the engineers would have to crawl into these minefields and begin to clear safe lanes for the attack. They would have to work in the dark and in silence, and they had just two nights to complete the job. The key element of any mine is the firing mechanism. Pressure on it causes the mine to explode. Demining involves first of all locating the mine, then removing or disabling the firing mechanism, and then removing the disarmed mine to a safe place. The mine clearance teams had to work quickly and quietly. They knew that a single mistake could cost them their life. To save time, the engineers only removed detonators, leaving the actual mine in place. They also had to worry about German booby traps, including trip wires hidden amongst the long summer grass. Both sides were forced to constantly refine and update their methods to counter new threats or tricks devised by the enemy. Step by step, the engineers picked a path through this lethal landscape. In just two nights, they diffused 34,000 mines. It was the final stage of preparation. Through these cleared lanes, the Red Army was now poised to launch one of the largest and most decisive operations in history. The final preparations had been made for the great Soviet summer offensive of 1944. A last-minute change to its timing only added to the weight of expectation. Operation Bagration would begin on the 22nd of June, the third anniversary of Germany's invasion. The offensive began on the northern flank with probing attacks in the vicinity of Vitebsk. Here, infantry of the 1st Baltic and 3rd Bielorussian fronts successfully stormed the German frontline trenches. By nightfall, Soviet units were engaged along the entire front as probing attacks gave way to full-blooded assault. Hundreds of aircraft arrived overhead to pour bombs onto the German front line. At dawn, the T-34s joined the assault. Swarms of Ilyushin ground attack aircraft crossed the front line with orders to hunt and destroy German artillery batteries in the enemy rear. German heavy artillery was a feared opponent, capable of stalling the whole offensive. 
but it was also extremely vulnerable to air attack. In low-level strafing attacks, the IL-2s used machine guns, cannons and rockets to mow down gun crews and destroy ammunition stockpiles. The Ilyushin IL-2 was designed by Sergei Ilyushin of the Soviet Central Design Bureau. It became the most heavily produced military aircraft of all time. The crew and engine were protected by armor. This was essential to protect them from small arms fire when making low-level attacks at an altitude of just 25 to 50 meters. The IL-2 was slow and therefore extremely vulnerable to German fighter attack. So by the second half of the war, they always flew their missions with a fighter escort. But by June 1944, the Luftwaffe was a shadow of its former self. German Army Group Center had just 40 fighters available for air defense. Its troops had been left wide open to Soviet air attack. Soviet Sturmovik ground attack aircraft roamed freely over the battlefield, often dispensing with their fighter escorts. Meanwhile, Hitler had come up with the idea of the fortress town. Troops defending locations with this special status were expected to fight to the last man, even when completely surrounded. One such fortress town was Vitebsk. The city was held by the 53rd Corps, part of General Reinhardt's 3rd Panzer Army. After the first day's fighting, Reinhardt proposed to withdraw his forces from Vitebsk before they became cut off. But Field Marshal Bush passed on the Führer's order. The city was to be held at all costs. On the third day of the battle, the Red Army duly encircled the 53rd Corps at Vitebsk. Only now, when it was too late, did Hitler authorize a retreat. But he still insisted that one division be left behind in Vitebsk with orders to fight to the end. The Germans' desperate attempt to escape the trap was doomed from the start. The breakout was led by the 4th Luftwaffe Field Division, which got as far as the forests to the southwest of the city. There, it came under overwhelming artillery and air attack and was annihilated. After five days of fighting, the German 53rd Corps capitulated. 17,000 survivors entered captivity, amongst them the Corps commander, General Golwitzer. The single German infantry division left in Vitebsk met a similar fate. The Red Army burst into the city, capturing the bridge over the western Dvina. The Germans tried to escape at the last minute, but all were either killed or captured. Meanwhile, to the south, Rokossovsky's first Belarusian front began their attack towards the city of Bobrusk. This was where Rokossovsky was attempting his controversial two-pronged assault, from the direction of Rogachev and from the village of Parici. Zhukov arrived to observe the assault of General Gorbatov's Third Army. With Rokossovsky directing the southern attack across the marshes and Zhukov coordinating the northern assault, a clear rivalry had developed as to who would be the first to crack the German lines. Near Rogachev, Soviet heavy bombers attacked under cover of darkness. They were helped to their target by Red Army trucks, drawn up in long lines facing eastwards with their headlights turned on. These lights, hidden from the Germans, pointed the Soviet pilots towards their target. In his memoirs, General Gorbatov wrote, First we heard the buzz of light aircraft flying over to attack the enemy positions. Then this noise was joined by the rumble of heavy aircraft, wave after wave of them. Soon the enemy lines erupted in explosions and flame. At dawn, Soviet ground attack aircraft continued the bombardment. They strafed German trenches and pummeled strong points with rockets and bombs.
Soviet air attacks could be wild and inaccurate. But now, they also began to take a fearsome psychological toll on the German soldiers. With no protection from the Luftwaffe, they lived in almost constant fear of a sudden, deadly attack from above. Before the smoke had cleared, shells and Katyusha rockets screamed through the air. As the bombardment raged, minesweeping tanks began their advance. Their heavy rollers detonated the mines in their path, clearing wide lanes for the tanks and self-propelled guns that followed in their wake. Despite this massive assault by land and air, the Red Army continued to encounter fierce German resistance around Rogachev. But further to the south, around the village of Parici, General Rokossovsky was making steady progress through the swamps and forests. Now he ordered forward General Pliev's mechanized cavalry corps to exploit the breach. Rokossovsky's gamble on a two-pronged assault had paid off. He had made a breakthrough, and he had done it before Zhukov. Army Group Center's only Panzer Division was ordered to make a counterattack near Rogachev. But at the last moment, it received urgent new orders to move south to block Rokossovsky's advance. Many of its vehicles broke down in the difficult, marshy terrain. But Rokossovsky had widened the breach and was already pouring in fresh troops. One Panzer Division was not going to stop him now. German defences around Rogachev, robbed of their tank reinforcement and under Zhukov's incessant hammer blows, now collapsed. The German 9th Army was encircled. Two days later, it surrendered. 20,000 Germans were taken prisoner. The Red Army's next objective was Minsk, the capital of Bielorussia. Its liberation was to be led by General Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army. The plan was for Rotmistrov's tanks to dash straight down the Smolensk-Minsk highway. But attempts to capture Orsha along the route had been bloodily repulsed. So the decision was taken to launch the attack from the vicinity of Vitebsk, where the Red Army had already blown a hole through the German defences. The 5,000 vehicles of the 5th Guards tank army began their attack towards Borisov, deep in the rear of Army Group Centre. For two days, their advance met virtually no resistance. Meanwhile, Hitler had relieved Field Marshal Busch of command. His successor was Field Marshal Model, the so-called Führer's fireman and master of defence. But he inherited a desperate situation. Three Soviet fronts were advancing on Minsk. The Germans were in full retreat, hoping to reach the Berezina River. But the Red Army already held most of the crossing points. The Germans held just one bridge on the Mogilev-Minsk highway. Thousands of German vehicles, carts and soldiers were now converging on the bridge. One German witness described the scene. The scramble was wildest on the approaches to the bridge. Carts and cars were trying to push each other off the road. Each wanted to be first onto the bridge. There were fights and swearing. The military police were powerless. And always, there was the constant fear of air attack. Sturmovic ground attack aircraft mauled retreating columns of German troops. Increasingly, the situation began to resemble the summer of 1941. But now, the roles were reversed. It was the Germans' turn to flee in terror and confusion, under incessant attack from above. And now, they could expect neither respite nor mercy.
As German army group center threatened to disintegrate, the Wehrmacht threw its medium bombers into the battle. It was hoped they could halt the Soviet tank columns and earn their own troops some desperately needed breathing space. But in the face of Soviet air superiority, daylight raids led to heavy losses for little gain. One week into the offensive, German panzer divisions began to arrive from Ukraine. The German 5th Panzer Division, reinforced with a battalion of Tiger tanks, prepared to meet the advance of Rotmistrov's army. The Tigers and Panthers slowed the Soviet advance to a bloody crawl. In July 1944, the 5th Guards tank army had yet to receive the new T-34-85 tanks. This updated version had a much more powerful 85mm gun. Although it didn't make them the equal of a German Tiger or Panther tank, it did make their encounters less one-sided. The tank battles raged for two days. The Red Army suffered enormous losses. But German tank strength was also reduced from 159 to just 18 tanks. The fate of Minsk was sealed. Tigers and Panthers had bought Army Group Center some time. But they couldn't prop up the entire front. At dawn on the 3rd of July, tanks of the 1st and 3rd Bielorussian fronts rolled into Minsk from the north and southeast, encircling the remnants of two German armies. Meanwhile, the 2nd Bielorussian front harried the German retreat from the east. It took a week to eradicate German resistance within Minsk. The encirclement at Minsk led to the capture of another 35,000 prisoners, including 12 generals. By now, German Army Group Center had suffered catastrophic losses. 17 of its divisions had been wiped out in just two weeks of fighting. The Germans had suffered total casualties estimated at 409,000. 150,000 of these were prisoners. The German panzer divisions remained a potent weapon, but Army Group Center no longer had the manpower to form a defensive line. Operation Bagration did not end until the 19th of August, by which time the Red Army had reached central Poland, the border of East Prussia and the Baltic Sea. Five Soviet fronts on a front of more than a thousand kilometers had advanced between 550 and 600 kilometers. The success of the operation surpassed the wildest expectations of the Stavka High Command. After Operation Bagration, Stalin began to address Rokossovsky using both his name and patronymic Konstantin Konstantinovich. The only person he'd honored in this way before was Marshal Shaposhnikov, his most trusted general. The Soviet victory was so overwhelming that some foreign press agencies doubted whether the reports were accurate. So Stalin decided to prove it. He gave the order to begin Operation The Great Waltz, named after a popular American film of 1938. Trains from Bielorussia secretly began to arrive in Moscow. The central Moscow Hippodrome and the Dynamo Stadium were cordoned off. On the 17th of July, it was announced to the public that German prisoners of war captured in Operation Bagration would be paraded through the streets of Moscow. 
Muscovites poured onto the streets to witness this strange spectacle. The procession was led by 19 German generals in full uniform. They were followed by more than a thousand officers. After them shuffled columns of weary, unshaven soldiers. This was what Stalin wanted the world to see, the fate of Adolf Hitler's once proud conquering army. The people of Moscow watched for the most part in silence. In many of their minds, the German soldier had become almost totally dehumanized. The Soviet people had been subjected to endless propaganda, but they had also suffered terrible and brutal losses. To many, the German soldier was a fascist beast, responsible for murders and rapes and the burning of villages and towns. Fifty-seven thousand German prisoners were paraded through the city en route to labor camps in the east. The procession was followed up by street cleaners, washing away all trace of the hated fascists. This startling display made a huge impression on Muscovites and foreign observers alike, as was its intention. Now, None had any doubt of the war's ultimate victorious conclusion. The collapse of German Army Group Center allowed the Red Army to advance towards Poland and East Prussia. In the Baltic region, the advance was led by General Bagramian's 1st Baltic Front and General Chernyakovsky's 3rd Belarusian Front. On the 8th of July, Chernyakovsky's troops reached the outskirts of Vilnius. The city was soon surrounded, and after five days of vicious house-to-house -house fighting, the garrison laid down its arms. The Third Guard's mechanized corps made a bold and rapid advance, covering 70 kilometers to reach the Lithuanian city of Shole. On the 31st of July, the commander of its 8th Mechanized Brigade radioed Corps headquarters to tell them, we're on the beach of the Gulf of Riga. This short radio message meant something incredible. All German forces in the Baltic were now cut off. The commander's report was so unexpected that his Corps commander asked him to repeat it. Then he gave him the following unusual order. Fill three bottles with seawater, then seal the bottles and have the commander sign them personally to confirm that the water was taken from the Baltic Sea. Then send the bottles to Corps headquarters. The bottles of seawater were delivered to front headquarters by aircraft and from there sent to Moscow. They were on their way to Stalin. Soon, the bottles stood on a Kremlin table as proof that Soviet tanks had reached the sea. Operation Bagration had smashed open the Eastern Front. Now, the Red Army was on the move in the Baltic. Next stop was Tallinn. The Estonian capital was the objective of Red Army units of the 8th Estonian Rifle Corps under Lieutenant General Pern. He organized a motorized column which covered 100 kilometers in one day. His men stormed into Tallinn and took the city on the 22nd of September 1944. Now there just remained German Army Group North, trapped in the Courland Peninsula. Despite repeated requests from General Guderian, now chief of the general staff, Hitler refused to allow the troops to be evacuated from Courland. 
the German pocket in Courland was described as an armed prisoner of war camp. The troops trapped there ceased to have any influence on the course of the war. Army Group Courland finally laid down its arms on the 11th of May 1945, two days after Germany's surrender. The Red Army had reached the border of East Prussia. It was here, at Königsberg, that remnants of Army Group Center had withdrawn after defeat in Bielorussia. The shattered German formations had received new recruits and new weaponry. The Red Army couldn't safely bypass such a potential hornet's nest. Nor did the prospect of a long siege appeal to the Stavka. The decision was taken to isolate East Prussia with a thrust north into East Pomerania, towards Danzig on the Baltic coast. Then resistance in East Prussia would be methodically broken down. It would be hard. Many German units now fought fanatically to defend Germany from the wrath of the Red Army. The job of breaking through to the Baltic was entrusted to Rokossovsky's second Belarusian front. He attacked on the 14th of January 1945. But just one day into the offensive, the weather took a turn for the worse. Rokossovsky recalled, it was already daylight, but nothing could be seen. Everything was hidden by a veil of mist and falling snow. The weather was abominable, and the meteorologists predicted no improvement. So I cancelled all air operations. The artillery fired blindly into the snowstorm. The infantry advance was slow, just three or four kilometers on the first day. The Germans stiffened their defense with Tiger tanks and Sturmgeschutz assault guns. General Reinhardt, now in command of Army Group Center, still hoped to launch an armored counterattack to stem the Soviet advance. But his tanks were sent south to face more Soviet offensives on the Vistula. Reinhardt could only call on the elite Panzergrenadier Division Gross Deutschland. As it began its advance, it ran into 500 Soviet tanks of the Front Reserve. By 1945, the T-3485 was the main tank of the Red Army. It retained many of the characteristics of the earlier T-3476, such as excellent mobility and reliability. The main improvement was a powerful 85mm gun, housed in a larger three-man turret. The size of the crew was increased to five. About 80,000 of these tanks were produced by the USSR before production finally came to an end in 1950. They remained in service with many armies around the world until the 1990s. After having defeated the enemy's tank reserve, Rokossovsky ordered forward the 5th Guards Tank Army. Reinhardt appealed to Hitler. My Führer, a captured enemy map shows that the Russian tank army is moving towards Danzig. If it gets through, we'll be attacked from the rear and unable to defend ourselves. Reinhardt requested permission to retreat. Nine days passed before Hitler agreed. By then, it was too late. The Soviet tanks had reached the Vistula Lagoon. East Prussia had been cut off from the Reich. Chernyakovsky's third Belarusian front had arrived at Königsberg from the east. German Army Group Center had been chopped into three parts. Bad weather prevented the Soviet Air Force attacking the retreating columns of men and vehicles. This allowed the Germans to assemble improvised fighting groups around Königsberg. 
they were still able to offer fierce resistance. On the 18th of February, 1945, General Chernyakovsky, commander of the 3rd Belarusian Front, was badly wounded by shell fragments at Melsak. He died the same day. He was just 39 years old. Marshal Vasilevsky arrived to take command of Soviet troops in East Prussia. Marshal Alexander Vasilevsky was the chief of the Soviet general staff for most of the war. This meant he was responsible for planning most of the major Soviet operations on the Eastern Front. He was described by colleagues as polite and diplomatic, and he was trusted by Stalin. However, some said Vasilevsky lacked the courage to stand up to him. Vasilevsky was twice decorated as hero of the Soviet Union. Gradually, German resistance in East Prussia was overcome. The pocket south of Königsberg was first to fall. Königsberg itself did not surrender until April 1945. In East Prussia, the Red Army faced fanatical German resistance. But Soviet firepower was overwhelming. In his memoirs, Vasilevsky described the East Prussian offensive as the most expensive in history in terms of the consumption of ammunition. He estimated that in this campaign, the Red Army used over 15,000 railway carriages of ammunition. The fortified city of Königsberg was finally pummeled into submission by the Soviet artillery. Its surrender netted the Red Army another 92,000 prisoners. By this point, Marshal Zhukov was putting the final touches on his plan for the assault on Berlin. To the south, fighting continued to rage in Czechoslovakia and Hungary. The second and third Ukrainian fronts battled elite SS divisions as they advanced on Austria. All had been made possible by the success of Operation Bagration. In the south, too, the Red Army had travelled a long and bitter road to victory. It had begun many miles to the east in 1943, as Soviet troops prepared to cross the Dnieper River. Before them lay the Battle of Ukraine. 